Hey friends, it's Tim here again from Black Swamp Percussion, and you're listening to episode 23 of the Black Swamp Podcast. As always, thanks for tuning in. Feel free to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and have a good time exploring our growing collection of episodes. Uh, we've had some great conversations with uh, PSP artists and educators like Keith Aleo, Joe W. Moore, Gloria Yahalevsky, and more over the last year as well as upcoming episodes featuring Abby Fisher, M.B. Gordy, and Tim Adams. So there's a little bit of something for everybody. One bit of housekeeping before we dive into our conversation with Andrew Baldwin. Uh, Typically, um, the Black Swamp team would be headed into our convention season, uh, traveling to PASIC, uh, Midwest and Chicago, uh, the NAM show in Anaheim, and TMEA in Texas. But obviously, the exhibit landscape uh, has changed due to the pandemic. Since we can't all travel and see each other in person, insert sad face emoji here, we thought we'd try and bring the show to you. So beginning November 12th, we are launching a new virtual exhibit experience. This includes enhanced product details on our website, new artist and educator contributions, and exclusive product promotion through our friends at Percussion Source. Uh, This promotion also includes a full selection of snare drums, quote, on display, unquote, available at a discount for a limited time. So visit our website after November 12th for full details. So Andrew Baldwin is a BSP concert artist based in the Chicago area. Besides teaching, freelancing, and composing in and around the Windy City, Andrew is also active in the comedic community being a student and participant in Chicago's Second City programs. Um, So we obviously talk about all his music and comedy interests, um, but we also chat about his interest in working with youngsters and the skills professionals might need to keep themselves working, especially during these more challenging times for performers. So here we go. Andrew, how you doing, man? I'm fantastic as most musician and art folk are i'm so good (laughs) yeah you're getting by getting by i mean it helps that i also do i also have day job work with uh, an orchestra doing grant writing so that's helping oh okay but uh yeah not i had my first performance since uh march about a week ago maybe yeah a week ago and there was just okay. some outdoor cabaret, but it was really nice right. to play for humans again, not over Zoom. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. So, back up grant writing. We're just going to jump right in right now, Andrew. What Let's What's up it. with grant writing? Um, what uh, What does that involve? Well, as opposed to every time I've tried writing a grant for myself, it's usually pretty. <laughs> uh, these ones are just pretty straightforward because it's for. Uh, this orchestra in Chicago called Music of the Baroque. So, you know, a lot of their foundation supports pretty set. I mean, there's, you know, some variances, some wavering, and then foundations close. But for the most part, they're the ties, except for the foundations that, you know, they try to make new connections with. It's really established connections. So I'm just, it's kind of like... (laughs) Here's here's our yearly ask for money, and they say okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that? I mean, is that something you had experience with before, or you kind of just learn learn on that job? I just I'm just asking because oh, yeah. <laughs> I've tried I've tried my hand before a long time ago when I worked with with like an indoor like drumline ensemble, and we were kind of trying to get money any which way we could, and yeah. the concept of grant writing came up, and I was like, wow, I'm in over my head right now, <laughs> but. Uh, like, is that something you had experience doing or you were you're already familiar with or just kind of learn as you go? Kind of learn as I go. I mean, yeah. f- reaching out to organizations to give you money. Um, I've only done it in an insular sense that I would do research grants through the colleges I would go through. And, oh, okay. you know, if it's a decent project that just makes the school look OK, they're pretty... <laughs> pretty good at handing right. out funding so so now as an undergrad yeah, I this got, makes us look good yeah so in undergrad i would get research grants the two projects i did was a uh, woodwind was well, saxophone and percussion duos uh rap right. and so we just did the first 
piece for percussion and saxophone and then we just did a random smattering of pieces to show um compositional trends for the duo right you know into the 2010s because that's when the project happened and then we did a project for recreating the birth of the cool album so okay it was really just cool excuses to uh just play (laughs) get you know have the school buy us music and then have us make cds so and then so um so you're writing grants as part of school but then as a as an opportunity to to write like you're like arranging your own stuff i mean obviously you mentioned playing some pieces that were existing for percussion Mm. and saxophone but like birth of the cool album um um, like you're doing the arrangements of that album or you're doing your own um, yeah that one was stuff that one was specifically trying to recreate you know the same solos they did and the same right. feel so it wasn't trying to be too adventurous um i will i will personally uh to my chagrin admit that most of the grants i wrote for myself for me to go make my own cd of my own jazz compositions okay none of those have gotten funded right. <laughs> but, <Okay. laughs> but uh but you have the experience yeah like you, you sort of are doing it i mean is that something you would recommend to to young professionals young percussionists or musicians like to kind of be fluent in that type of um uh like professional application yeah definitely because you're always you're either going to with my experience and then a lot of the people that i talk to frequently you're either a performer or you're teaching if you're really trying to you know you you don't just stop and just kind of dabble in music so then right teachers always have to write grants to get you know the new instruments for their school or what have you and then sure. if you're a performer you know if you're not in like a top orchestra then you're playing in a chamber ensemble that you and some friends maybe started in college and now you're trying to take it to the next level so then you need real funding you know right. it's so you become a 501c3 ensemble and then you know you don't want to just do that haphazardly realistic it's right. kind of like how people in my mind you know don't go for a doctorate if you don't really want to teach. It's kind of the same thing sure. in my mind. You know, don't go become a nonprofit ensemble if you're not really trying to get foundation money. Or uh, right. like in Chicago, Chicago's nice because well, this year before <laughs> before the pandemic, it's the year <laughs> it's the year of music. So they're they're right. like tossing so much money into music organizations throughout the entire city working to build a new I think they're trying to build a new big art center somewhere on the south side and but they're really into every year you can apply for funding as an individual artist the only stipulation is you have to be a resident of Chicago but other than that you know you don't you don't have to be part of a 501c3 ensemble you don't have to be whatever you have to be a professional musician you know whatever that means in any capacity Um, so, so 501 C3 for those people who are listening and might not know the terminology, that's obviously like a nonprofit kind of designation. Like, is, can you, can you expand on that a little bit? Like, you know, maybe what specifically that means we're going off book now. Right now Andrew. I didn't, I, we did, we didn't, I didn't send you any information on this. So I'm already putting you on the spot, but it, I, I, it's already interesting because I think these are things that as like professional musicians or percussionists, like a kid in school that. You know, you were there when you were in an undergrad and graduate school, and now you're in Chicago freelancing and teaching and composing and writing grants. Like, it's kind of, I think, really helpful, useful information. So kind of what does a nonprofit organ, like ensemble, uh, not necessarily look like, but, you know, how does that operate versus maybe like Third Coast? Are they, I don't even know, are they... Are they nonprofit or they're making they're making money or so percussion? There's they're making money like that's this is something I've never really thought about. So how does that all that work? All right. So I have a very outside <laughs> perspective of the technicalities. Right, right. I've, I've seen friends form ensembles and just get their 501c3 status. But so 
Right. The, the crux of it, right, is to make you a tax tax exempt organization. Sure. And then, like I said before, a lot of money giving out organizations really want you to be have nonprofit status before they give you money so they can write it okay. up on their taxes right that's uh, that's the yeah. big draw so then it's all about the man i guess it so is all, you know of, so yeah. you can get yeah. everyone you can that's the caveat you know give us money so right. we can make this great art but also you get a nice little tax receipt but yeah, um sure. out of the out of the benefits i mean or the reasons why that's again, me not having been in a huge role in a nonprofit organization or small chamber ones. I'm pretty sure I think third coast is nonprofit right. or like eighth blackbird. They all right. hit that nonprofit status, but there, I know I couldn't tell you them. So I'm going to do this super cool thing of telling you something I know nothing about. But there are <laughs> jo- join the club, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, like fake it till you make it. I think that that sometimes is, like there's is, is a motto. So that, go ahead. that is my mantra. <laughs> <laughs> right. But there are some instances, I think, where you 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 weigh it out and you th- you say, OK, it's not terribly worth becoming a nonprofit. It's kind of like when you leave school and you say, I'm going to start my own teaching studio and then you can say, do I just keep teaching out of my house or what my apartment or whatever? Or do I form sure. an LLC? So then if some kid is walking up in the winter, if you're in a snowy state and they break their leg, they don't sue you as a human. They sue your right. LLC. And then so you just, yeah. you know, because that just saves you personally. Um, so there's. A lot of avenues. I don't know many ensembles that would become an LLC. That's usually just the right. more of a business or yeah. kind of corporate. Like I mean, Black Swamp Percussion is an LLC, for instance. Like our technical, technically, our name is Black Swamp Percussion LLC. So, yeah. Um, do you think that's uh, kind of getting weaving into COVID a little bit? Do you think that's becoming? Uh, something that performers or educators are thinking about more like how are they gonna promote their business or what is involved in that and the only reason i ask is because i have a friend who's a, a veterinarian and she kind of semi-retired she's not at retirement age at all like but she's like because <laughs> of covid and and she was working less and so she essentially you know was taking some extended time off and she's like, I'm considering going into business for myself, almost like like old school, um, you know, vets or doctors would make house calls, you know, yeah. kind of little house on the prairie style. And <laughs> and she's like, you know, I could make house calls or I could just do whatever and be a vet and work for myself. And but I would have to, you know, be self-employed and maybe do an LLC or something like that. So I'm so that's why I'm asking. You think there, there's kind of that thought process now because of the climate performance and teaching climate has changed a little bit or am I stretching right now? I think that's totally possible and very plausible. <laughs> totally just, po- yeah, it's totally just, possible. It's, yeah. That, that, yeah. I don't mean that in the polite way when, you know, you say something to a teacher and the teacher is right. politely saying you're wrong, but <laughs> right. Right. I just know a lot of my friends personally that went the LLC route, you know, they, they finally started getting they they got out of grad school decided to just be that studio teacher in whatever town they live in and then they right. they were getting enough students you know they didn't want to go put their studio at the lesson part of some music store so then they have to share that cut but then right. just re, i think you know more people are talking them into doing that cuz i mean i i don't personally think a lot of my friends that have gone, you know, it's like, I did a lesson with the principal, whatever, of the CS, whatever. Right. <laughs> you know? right. Um, I don't think those, well, they can't. I don't, I, I'm, I'm going to, again, I don't know this, but I'm going to say it confidently like I do. I'm going to assume, right. like, the principal, any player, or anyone in a major orchestra, they're a union musician. So... They technically can't take union gigs, right? And I don't know how right. sketchy that gets when you talk about one-off private lessons because they also, a lot of them teach too. So 
you know, they're not forming LLCs um, to have these random one-off lessons. Right. So it's not important yeah. for them. Also, you know, they're also... Yeah, it's not advantageous. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's right off the bat. I think it's pretty interesting and cool that, like, this is part of your kind of, you know, thought process as a musician. So all you kids out there listening... Uh, <laughs> yeah. all, ten, all 10 or 20 of you you kids that might be listening right now like yeah I think um, uh, it's definitely worth like kind of having that vocabulary of you know what it means to run a business or what kind of what what all that entails did you take business classes at all and in no school? I wish uh, then I would maybe have money to buy <laughs> instruments because <laughs> I'd yeah, be right, fiscally right. responsible but that is a yeah. lot of my teachers have always said you know when you get out into the real world as a musician, you are a business and you have to sell yourself. Yeah. Even if you aren't legally a business, you know, you're trying to get the gigs yeah. over these however many hundreds of potentially thousands of other percussionists. And you need to say yeah. why I, as a product, am the best choice. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. So your your teachers being, I know, uh, Tony DeSanza, mm -hmm. you studied with him. In Madison, was that undergrad? And that was master graduate school. Oh, just okay. Masters. So where'd you go to um, undergrad? Another Wisconsin school, UW Whitewater. Okay. So that's with okay. Toby Wilkinson. Um, I actually started at <laughs> again UW Green Bay, um, and then <laughs> I transferred to Whitewater. So I study. She's not okay. there at the time. I believe the guy there now is Bill Salick is his name yep. yeah Bill. Uh, right and and i met him at madison because he came to do a master class he's a very cool gentleman okay but my teacher at the oh, time yeah. was cheryl grosso um okay. she's it's a very hip woman purple hair yeah tough <laughs> <laughs> cool so that that was at green bay yeah or, you said, okay yeah. cool and then yep um, toby at whitewater and then DeSanza. At Madison. Okay, so did you, um, did you grow up in Wisconsin then? You're oh yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a terrible Wisconsinite. Yeah, a Wisconsinite. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as schooling, it was. It's very funny because as I got older, I realized I knew nothing. That's that's the story of most people's lives, I think. But mine, to a T, right. is just. I, this thing I thought I knew a decent bit about. So music, I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to help people. So I really wanted to be a guidance counselor in, when I was in high school, but then I really liked oh, music. Wow. So yeah. I figured I'll be a music teacher. And then right. a friend of mine randomly said, I'm going to UW Green Bay, why don't you go with me? So I said, sure, why not? Because I wasn't, um, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and Actually, I grew up in Elkhorn, Wisconsin, and people only know about it if you are in the area and you like Jimmy Buffett because he always plays a concert <laughs> at like this neighboring That's... amphitheater. Right. And yeah. uh, Holton, the brass Getson, uh, they're okay out of Elkhorn. But I say all. So of are you not? Are you not a parrot head then? Oh, far from you it. Not... <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I can't do it. <laughs> No. Okay. I have a very eclectic music taste. It's like I know, you know, right. I like jazz, so I know jazz. But then, as far as pop, right. pop music kind of starts in '90, like the mid '90s with Blink 182. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. So none of this. Your your varied you know, like musical palette does not include Jimmy Buffett then. No. That's fine. No. My mom was a golden oldies gal, and my dad was a oh, okay '90s R and B guy. So those are yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, what I cool. grew up with. But yeah, great. Yeah, I didn't really, I liked music, but I wasn't aware of, I knew orchestras exist. We all had to watch Fantasia in fourth grade, but I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't thinking that's attainable. So I didn't even think about right. doing it. I just wanted to help kids and teach music. And then right. I had to, tra I didn't have to, I transferred to Whitewater because it was closer to my home and I just needed to help out with some family stuff, but I transferred late like I, I had finished three years at uh, Green Bay, so I just didn't. <laughs> I, you know, I started as a senior there, 
and to finish the ed major would have tacked on another three years from that point so i just switched to performance oh, yeah. and then <laughs> but also while i was you know, like going through my degrees or like going through undergrad i f- knew i wanted to go to grad school and then i wanted to yeah. i realized i wanted to teach college because kids don't necessarily take band because they love it (laughs) you know in the lower grades whereas if you or your parents are forking out money at the college level to learn music you might pay a little bit more of attention so then yeah sure so then i just decided to stick with performance and then go to madison hang out with desanza yeah Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, my story is not at all similar, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Uh, yeah, I knew I would, I had no, I had no desire to be a band director at any, at any point, like be a music educator, just because I knew what going through the band program and seeing what my band directors like endured and suffered, like there's no way I could handle that. And um, I just, I taught privately a little bit. Like I had some private students kind of in college and stuff. And, um, I like the local music store and I was okay with that and taught, you know, pit or drumline type stuff. And I was okay with like smaller groups. Uh, but well, I had no, I had no inclination to be like a, a band director or, or music educator by trade. So people would ask me like, well, what you're going into music, huh? What are you, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. I'm right. going to do something. I'm just going to keep playing. And that's, yeah, I went to grad school and for that reason, just because I, I wanted to keep playing like through, you know, undergrad. And then I went to the University of Akron. Um, and, um, you know, basically that's what I told uh, Dr. Snyder. He's like, well, why do you want to go to grad school? It's like, because I'm not done playing, man. I want to keep, I want to keep, keep doing it. So, and even then I didn't know if I was going to try to play in an orchestra or if I was going to, I knew I didn't want to teach maybe get my doctorate like you're saying i think i think you have a really good point like people are forking out money shelling out money to go to school they're probably more inclined to um kind of devote that time um so i thought kind of thought about that but i had already started working with at black swamp kind of like very part-time when i was undergrad like essentially the first employee that eric the owner had (laughs) so we had kind of kept in touch in grad school and then he invited me to come back and work full-time and i was like sure <laughs> like and there was playing opportunities and gr- i'm f- kind of from the grand rapids michigan area so we're just across the lake sort of from where nice. i think where you where you grew up and um uh so i was like well there's opportunity i was started picking up some orchestral stuff and then some other freelance stuff and i was playing a lot of steel band i was playing a lot of jimmy buffett man i was a lot of margaritaville <laughs> cheeseburger in paradise with the steel band and uh some other stuff and so i was able to kind of work and play and it 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 all worked out but yeah do you still kind of have a drive to work with kids or or sort of make a difference in that that setting with with playing music or whatever you're whatever you got going on i do um and it comes in different forms and in different waves depending on the day (laughs) so so, yeah right so some days um I mean, whenever I have young students, usually I try, my rule of thumb is I don't like teaching kids that are under 10 just because right. I, I, <laughs> cause they're lot, annoying. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of my it, friends will give it's okay. me, I can say that cause I have an eight year old and a teenage <laughs> and a 13 year old girl. So I'm allowed to say that I've experienced it. So go ahead. Sorry. And, yeah. And I say that not to, you know, crap on children, but right. a lot of people confuse that my not wanting to work with small children as an inability to, I don't want to toot my own horn. I'm very good at dealing right. with children, but <laughs> as far as trying to get musical oh, yeah. things done, I just need them to right. be able to focus a little bit, but every yeah. once in a while, someone will sneak and be like, you know, this, this person's eight but I think she'd be a really good fit. And I was teaching this little eight-year-old girl and she, 
it's hard to tell, you know, because, you know, they might in a year completely lose interest. But she has, I think, right. the best ear I've heard on a child. You know, I could play right. anything and she could pick it up. She, you know, her reading is rough because she's eight, but right. she's she's so good. But I bring that up to say that she's this little black girl. And in right. my head, I'm just sitting here like, please stick with it. I'm... <laughs> You, you will go so far and you will be such an inspiration. You, yeah. And like I said, my first professor was this woman that was not afraid to be like, this is a male dominated field. And I succeeded in just really pushing that, that important narrative. So every time I have a young student, especially if they are a girl, I'm like, man, I always view it like get it's also selfish. I'm like, get famous. Right. Say that I was the one. <laughs> I was the one that pushed yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ballman it inspired me. Yeah. Right. But I, I, I'm this... always... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is that... I mean, is that something that you talk to your student about specifically? Or you kind of think, okay, she's too young to kind of grasp that concept. You just need to encourage her in general. Yes. To both of those. if I mean, if it seems like if I've had with that exact student, I've had, you know, I'll wear, I'll come with a shirt one day that says black creative on it. And she goes, right. what does that mean? I was like, oh, you know, it's just showing that I like being black and being creative. Just showing it off, yeah. you know. So, like, I'm not afraid to say these things because this is the world we live in. But I've had... Yeah teenage students and i'll say you know like if you go to school for this you will be a handful of women in your field you know and that's changing slowly like everything it's changing right. slowly i think it's better now than when i was an undergrad the few times i've in recent years have been in a college program you know doing whatever work or something but right. i you know it's it also reminds me of when I was a kid. I I really appreciated when teachers would talk to me like I wasn't stupid, <laughs> you know. Or <laughs> right. I have the yeah. I have the mental fortitude to understand what is happening, and then just you know, I'm not having a whole conversation of like right. disenfranchised people, <laughs> but I'm <laughs> I'm not afraid to touch on it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a really good point because, well, first, especially with your student you know, she's a female and African American, like, like there's already multiple obstacles. She has to kind of like embrace almost like to get past. And then, um, you know, kind of knowing or understanding that, that her, where she could be with her talent and then her as a person could be really inspirational to other, other, um, young women, other young women of color so i think it's cool that you can have that conversation with her but then also know okay yeah you can't you can't talk about um disenfranchisement like you're <laughs> saying like you kind of have to approach it at a different level because we've had you know like i said i got two two girls 13 and almost nine i think in a month, a month <laughs> two months actually so that's important um and so i can't talk to them um um, you know, kind of at the same level about these things. So uh, when George Floyd was killed, you know, we have, I had conversations with both of them, but independently because I can talk a little bit more deeply and, and get a little bit more, give a little more backstory with my 13 year old. And then I can with my, my 10 year olds or nine year old rather. So, um, I think it's it's a valid point, kind of knowing, well, picking your battles a little bit, and then knowing yeah. what information to share, and kind of be able to to speak at certain levels, but also be kind of effective. So, yeah, I think it's cool. You're still still you're a role, basically a role model, and then you know educating on multiple levels. So, congratulations. It's not an easy thank thing you. to thank you try to address. <laughs> yeah, it's again. I, um, I like to say it's 90% me just trying to be a decent person and then 10% well, yeah, them sure. in their first Grammy acceptance speech. Like, you know, my first my first teacher. <laughs> They're coming. <laughs> They're coming, man. Yeah, so you're in Chicago now. I mean, how did you 
I mean, is, I mean, obviously Chicago's the nearest big city to where you went to school and kind of grew up. Was that a deciding factor on where to live, or was there something else that drew you to Chicago? Um, my girlfriend actually is. So we met at Madison. That'll do it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but she <laughs> she was in she was finishing her undergrad right as I was finishing my master's, and I will say this. Because I'm just saying this, so this is like recorded evidence, so she'll listen to this and yell at me. <laughs> it's on tape. Yeah, but she she tricked me. We met in a Baroque history class, <laughs> so that's already right. that should have been a red flag. Um, <laughs> and but it was an upper level class, so you the way Madison does it is you have your your musical gen eds when you're in grad school, you know, so you have to take okay. like two musicology upper level musicologies and a upper level theory so one of my musicologies was baroque history but there are, you know some seniors and stuff in there of some undergrads but older undergrads so i saw her and she was a big know-it-all always answered the questions <laughs> and so i i thought this person has to be a grad student and then we you know started dating and I was so mad when I found out she wasn't <laughs> like, oh. uh, yeah, a grad student. I was like, oh, I mean, obviously not so mad. That was five years ago. <laughs> right, right. But she, you've gotten over it by now. Yeah, I'm, I'm slightly over it. But <laughs> she, um, it's a process. It's you know every day just little by little working to take the weight off my shoulders. But <laughs> she um she went to grad school at Roosevelt, uh the CCPA. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's what they call right. it. And uh yeah, so that brought us here. And then she almost went to uh, I want to say Knoxville. Not that there's anything wrong with Knoxville, but I was right. s- so more pleased <laughs> that it was Chicago. <laughs> And not sure. Knoxville. So she's from Wisconsin area too, then. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So closer to the family, and and you, then you didn't have to move to Tennessee. But yeah, so. it was mostly the Tennessee. Yeah, I'm glad that bit. worked out for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, interesting story about like Roosevelt, because while well, you and I have met uh, like in person once before, I think when we first hey, met, actually UIC, and I was. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of doing a meet and greet or a petting zoo, I called them, um, with um, no, Jordan Camp. Sorry, I drew a blank there for a second. <laughs> and so, yeah, we met there. And then uh, that same, it was actually right before that, I was supposed to do a similar class at Roosevelt. And I was circling Roosevelt, like trying to figure out where <laughs> I was going to park and and following the directions that Ed Harrison gave me, who t- he teaches <laughs> yeah. at Roosevelt, and figuring out, like, trying to decipher that. And it was literally, like, 4.30 or 5 o'clock. I mean, it's busy anyways. And I totally, uh, totally my fault. I ran a red light on, uh, like, off of Michigan. It kind of does this big loop around, a uh, like, a statue or yeah. something. And I was coming back, like, headed towards Roosevelt, and I totally ran a red light and got into a car accident. Two-car, actually, oh, three-car no. accident. <laughs> My car was not drivable, and it, it was a yeah, it was a mess. So I I missed my event with Roosevelt, and then I spent like the next three hours like figuring out that situation and getting a <laughs> rental car. So long story short, actually, somebody uh, a guy like helped me. Of course, he owned a body shop, like a repair shop and a rental place, but he totally. It was like a godsend. Like he totally, <laughs> he stayed with me the whole night and he got me a rental and then he got, we took the car, you know, he got, he called a, a tow truck and got my car taken to place. So when I saw you, then I think the next day at, um, uh, in Illinois, in Chicago, University of Illinois in Chicago, I had like a rental car and I was still like stressed out. And stuff <laughs> like that. But yeah. Well, you hit it very so, well. Yeah. That's my. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you were yeah. just stressed out was, from all the undergrads. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, well, yeah. There was a couple, <laughs> a couple, couple odd things going on there, but um, uh, yeah, that's my Roosevelt story. So that's a good. That's me. a good Roosevelt story. <laughs> right. Well, I just felt bad because then Ed was. I was in the middle of dealing with that, like the the other drivers, because I was the thing I was scared most about was in I was in Chicago 
and I hit somebody, you know, and we weren't moving slowly and I didn't know who was going to get out of the car. I didn't know what I was going to encounter <laughs> like in this scenario. So fortunately it was two very nice um, people and they were, they were upset at first, but then totally understanding and helped me kind of, we helped each other kind of work through it because we ended up at the police station that's kind of down the street from Roosevelt, which was also another mess of a story. But anyway, so it was a lot of excitement for, for <laughs> one night. That's that's all. Um, so you're in Chicago with your girlfriend, um, you know, uh, freelancing, kind of gigging, teaching, um, which I think will – and composing, which I want to talk a little bit about. But what I think – one of the main reasons I reached out to you to do a, to do a podcast because I think there's something really interesting about you, and that is you're involved in improvisation, which is not just. And totally correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, <laughs> I'm pulling at what you're you're doing. I'm not a hundred percent sure of what I'm talking about, but I'm going to talk about it confidently right now. You are involved like with um, improvisation, like in comedy field, and even. Mm -hmm. um, uh second city so you are either a member of like a second city cast or like a feeder group or somehow involved with second city like which i found really cool and interesting obviously because of the comedic history uh that's associated with that organization so you can you i will let you take the floor now and just tell <laughs> me how you got interested in comedy and in second city and performing and improvising and then and so if you forget, I'll remind you, how does this perhaps intersect with some of your musical activities, if at all? So, yeah. Um, well, the the biggest thing that I'll have to unfortunately correct is I'm not on cast at Second City. Because <laughs> okay, that's like okay. that's like the Good. biggest thing is when you when you. Yeah, I'm even worse. Like I pay them to tell me I'm <laughs> how to be funny. So. Right, right. But they. Well, something's working. Yeah. You're cracking me up. <laughs> thank so. you. Thank you. That's. Right. That's all you need is one laugh to break any tension <laughs> in a hall of 10,000 people if one person laughs. Um, right. Um, yeah, they make you, they say, you know, if you go through such and such program, you can say you are a graduate of, you, you can't even say you're a graduate. You can say, I finished this program, but there's only one progr program you can take and say, I am a graduate of this program. And then if you right. actually get hired to act on their stages, then you can say I'm an alum of, you know, Second City. But um, oh, okay. so I guess, you know, it all started like most most hot blooded Americans. I loved <laughs> SNL and right. uh, my parents, my mom thinks I'm funny. <laughs> I had to correct that. My dad. I, oh, that's my, so sweet. I think my dad thinks I'm funny, but he just won't tell me. <laughs> right. That's a well. That's a dad's job. Yeah. Really difficult sometimes. I think. Yeah, he's like he'll be on his deathbed, and I'll be holding his hand, and he'll say, "You're funny," and then I'll be like, "Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Dad." But uh, you know, I've always liked that kind of thing, and I I was never I'm not good at like telling jokes. Um, I'm not that right. kind of, you know, like being a comedian, like a stand up comedian is very daunting because I just but and I do, you know, talk to people frequently. I've never had a problem getting up in front of crowds and making things up as I go. Uh, that's right. been a useful skill, you know, because you always have to give presentations in school. <laughs> but I've always been right. silly and always thought I was funny. And, you know, just you everyone knows that person where their life is dominated by someone saying you should be on SNL, which is right. a terrible thing to say to anyone. Cause it gives you, <laughs> it gives you false confidence from a very young age right. because yeah. it's kind of like with music, you know, you go to music school. I don't know if you had this, but I did. And a lot of friends, you know, you you're cloistered in this school of music and then there are some not talented people. There are some exceptionally talented people, but you are all there as musicians. And then you forget mm -hmm. that everyday people can be equally as musically talented. They just couldn't name you all the themes in the Beethoven <laughs> symphonies, you know? Right. So, sure. So it's similar that a lot of people are equally as funny as you. It's just, uh, <laughs> just trying, you kind of being at the right place at the right time. But I did yeah. always tell myself if I ended up in Chicago, 
I would go to Second City and start doing classes. Actually, when I was doing my grad school auditions, I auditioned at NYU because I really, I mean, you know, it's a good program, but I really, really, really wanted to be in there because one of the faculty members, Valerie, and I'm blanking on her last name, but she plays, she's the percussionist oh. in the SNL live band. Yeah, yeah. Valerie, like, Naranjo? Yeah. Naranjo? I, yeah. Yeah. I can't pronounce it either, so, so I'm slaughtering it. Sorry, <laughs> Valerie. So I was really... But I know who you're talking about. I was really hoping, you know, I would get into this nice program. I'd be in New York. Also, she would, like, maybe let me sit <laughs> behind her while she was <laughs> playing congas and stuff. Right. So, like, I was going to use right. that as a cheap in to Saturday Night Live, but uh, right. that didn't happen, so... <laughs> Fast, right. fast forward to living in Chicago, and then I signed up. I like applied to get a scholarship, which you know it's just them buying you a free class, and right. it's a very clever scholarship application because you know they're just really trying to suss out if they draw you in that you'll keep paying, <laughs> which I right. did. So yeah. I did their improv like a through e right so it's just teaching you the basics of improv but then before the pandemic started i got into their conservatory program which is the uh okay that's when people say oh tina fey got you know she studied at second city or these people bill murray it was this right. program that they went through so i got halfway right. through that and then it's you know switched to online so half right. of my last class was online and i'm like you know as as much fun as improv over Zoom is, <laughs> I was like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna wait till things get more in person, and right, don't know when that's gonna happen. But that is that's my yeah. second city journey. But I've done, uh, like they're not necessarily like open mics, but just you know, teams will have you know we need a ten to fifteen minute opening act to come before us sure so you know do some of those to play around i've written sh sketch shows with people that we've put on on our own through and they're mm. not and it's a similar thing where it's not th through second city but it's on their stages so okay. um i have not performed on the main stages at second city but i've performed on some of their auxiliary stages um yeah and some of the other theaters, the big improv theaters around Chicago. But, yeah. yeah. super cool i mean um do so do you is there anything that carries over to kind of music performance um, any any philosophies or concepts or just being on stage or performance in general like or everything. again am i stretching here no everything <laughs> no. everything ties over especially because i'm you know in the jazz and in the jazz improv and i like yeah, i sure. like free improv a lot or i just love improv of any kind so the, right. they are 100%. If you're talking about music improv and then acting or comedic improv, the parallels are like spot on. But wow. as yeah, far cool. as, you know, like you're saying, performance, just getting up in front of people and doing things or doing things out of your comfort zone. How many classical musicians, I'll never jazz or free improv because right. that's out of my comfort zone. So you do something like this right. and it helps. Um it helps give you different perspectives on things. It keeps you sharp-witted, you know, because you're trying to, right, trying to say something that's not completely ridiculous, but, you know, and also like being or organic, because you can really tell if someone tries to shoehorn a, a line in that they think is funny, and then, <laughs> right. you know, they're working a little too hard. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it takes away what, 
it does, you know, it takes away from the ensemble that's happening. You're trying to make it about you. Sure. You're trying to show that you're funny. Whereas realistically, the similarities in w- what should be the similarities in performance when you're in an improv group or an ensemble is it's about the ensemble. And I quote Drumline, the movie, so much, even though I I personally <laughs> do not like oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Drumline. <laughs> Uh, I mean, right. don't get me wrong. I like the movie. I don't much. It's an art form in and of itself, but you know, it's sure. not not my cup of tea. But you know, it's like right. if one of us looks or sound bad, you you all look and sound bad. So right, right. Um, sort of the the weakest link link concept. Exactly. You know. Uh, as f- but bringing it back to the similarities between improv, musical, and non musical is you're taught to listen right you're taught to enhance the other people in the group and you're taught that they have your back so that's all you know taking jazz improv classes that's that's the thing you don't want to step on someone else's toes you don't want to say too much you don't want to give too much away if you just keep rambling and rambling then it loses its punch and no one cares what you're doing so they're perfectly the same like i've I teach at a band camp at Whitewater every summer, and they I do jazz things there. I teach jazz improv and direct the jazz band. And this, obviously not this past year because of the virus, but um, two years prior, I most of the exercises I did with my improv kids were acting improv exercises. You know, because there's this one exercise where, and you know, it works better with a small group of 10 versus 40 to 50 middle schoolers. But right. there's this exercise where you all spread out, and then one person has to, like, you just freely moves around, but then you have to pass off the ability to move you know by making direct eye contact and non-verbally you have to you know signal to someone it's your turn to go and then but you know so you're teaching and in jazz that's you know all the non-verbals we use to be like all right like solo we're we're trading fours right then there's uh then there's variations on that exercise and one is taking the focus you know because sometimes someone will keep going and and you say i have to rein it in and it's that same exact exercise except anyone can only one cur- person can be moving at a time but you don't know who is going to start doing it and who's going to start doing it when so then if you're the person moving that means you're hyper vigilant you know you're on on your toes who's going to move cuz the second someone else starts moving you have to stop so that's just teaching you to be hyper aware of your surroundings which you know yeah so I it's good anyways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it helps you become a better jazzer and just a better human in general. Yeah. Um well, so I've had, you know, on the podcast I'd, uh conversations with Gloria Yahalevsky, mm-hmm. who well, she was recently in in Chicago. Um and then just the last episode with Anthony DiBartolo, who are both of them are very into improvisation and what I would consider more of uh, well, I don't want to say legit, but kind of orchestral improvisation or like electric, you know, Anthony is really into electronics and looping and mm-hmm. stuff like that, but also improvisation. So it's cool to hear like your perspective as more of a, uh, uh, a well, a, as a jazz musician, like talking about improvisation from a, a jazz perspective and, and kind of that that interaction with with people and when to not step on people's toes or when you know when to shift focus or not have something be all about yourself um i mean my my uh only interaction with improvisation was with when i i did a lot of steel band gigs so we'd be a small combo so I, i'm you know typically played double seconds and then there was a lead player and and then usually sometimes a guitar player um, that would solo, you know, in our quintet or whatever. So, you know, we, you know, one question I had for you is what are kind of the rules of engagement if there are any, but like, you know, we would talk, you know, murmur before we start, okay, I'm going to take two solos and you take two solos or we'll just go around or do this. Like, so we kind of figured it out, but we were so used to playing with each other. We could kind of 
we knew what the other person was doing. And actually, they, I, sometimes they would give me a hard time because they knew exactly, you know, when I was about to take a solo, they knew exactly what I was going to play. Every song, you know, <laughs> solo and each song kind of started the exact same way. And then I kind of went from there. Are those, do you kind of see those, you know, when you're working with kids, like, are there kind of rules of engagement, one? And then two, are, are there maybe a, uh, like a, some advice, like to not, not do you know i would get stuck basically on the same lick the same little run mm -hmm. or the same this and then just kind of play it in every solo that i played or that's how everything started like is there you know kind of something you would you know suggest to a young player or performer like hey this is a good exercise to to kind of get out of that rut so i sort of wrapped yeah two questions no, into i'm one trying there. to <laughs> i was going to i was going to answer it in a very non <laughs> like cohesive way so i'm gonna I'm, <laughs> right. i said that i'm still gonna do what i said i didn't want to do uh it's right. like two trains of thought that a lot of people talk about right are learn licks that you like from other people and then sure. you know try and fit them in different places blah 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 then you have people that say don't learn other people's licks that's then you just right. those are other people's things and then you just you're not thinking of your own ideas. I personally think that you, there's nothing wrong with learning other people's ideas because you know, that yeah. at some point that's all you're doing whenever you start something new is learning someone else's ideas. And then you yeah. can take things you like and um, change it up a little or take that lick. And I'm kind of thinking on percussion specifically uh drum right. i'm thinking drum set right now but you can ap apply it to melodic instruments you know take a lick and if it fits over the chords you know uh try putting where that you know if it ends on the one of the next beat have it end on the and of one or have it land on the two and you can feel the different stresses and then you can maybe hear oh well if it ends here i would like this to go before it um, mm -hmm. you know, and then practicing your licks and all the keys, that the usual thing. <laughs> I, I hate, I hated Jeez. that. I hated that yeah. so much. Yeah. And that's not well, when I, what, when I was in grad school, I did take like a summer semester, um, of jazz improv, like on vibraphone. And it was the saxophone professor that I studied from and he, we had to transcribe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was learning, you know, I transcribed some, I was, I took it easy on myself, like Chet Baker, solos like trumpet <laughs> solos uh which i mean i just love chet baker anyways um but and his solos were like really musical but kind of simple so i'm like oh yeah i think i can you know maybe transcribe that and then well then okay now i gotta learn this lick and every key or whatever like oh great now i gotta know all my i gotta remember all right all my i did and all my scales and everything so when i was learning theory and stuff i was Again, not to brag, but I was really I was really good at theory, but I say that to say I learned like all of my ear training was on numbers, you know. So I okay. like I'm actually very 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 bad at solfege, but I'm very good at I say that to say that my numbers really transferred to, you know, chord alterations and things. So when I think of a melody, it's easier for me because that's how my mind has worked forever to see the melody in its you know uh, scale numbers so then that's easier sure. to transfer when you're doing the transpositions but i that's another good thing is listening to other transcribing other instrument solo so if you well with vibraphone right you listen to Right. You listen to anybody and it's just trying to make like weird stick crossings work, but that's important because then, you know, right. if you, I was thinking Mark Juliana, um, cause we have this nice drum store. It's actually in my neighborhood of Chicago and it's called the Chicago music exchange. And Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Mark Juliana just happened to be there one day as I was walking by <laughs> doing, wow. doing a clinic or something. And so I walk in and he's, talking about similarly where this guy was like you know i'm learning these licks and blah 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 and he's like there's nothing wrong with learning licks but the lick is a th whatever the lick is it's something in your toolbox 
And then you have to take that and you have to do something to it, not just to make it your own, but it it adds something new to your toolbox. So, you know, if you're working on some triplet groove and you notice, you know, oh, it's really hard to do this, then make an exercise out of whatever is weak. And then that will eventually, you know, you build up your dexterity, but then that becomes another thing to add to your toolbox. So just doing little things to uh, expand that toolbox. I'm trying to remember what the other, because it was a two part question kind of. Uh, No, we'll we'll gloss (laughs) over that part. It it was more, it was more, no, I, uh, yeah, I first, I think what we're talking about is creativity and, and not, I mean, to your point of like whether you should you know use somebody else's lick or not use somebody else's lick or transcribe and not transcribe like it's about creativity and and it's really hard to come up with something like totally original like that everything is kind of based on something else so i've had conversations with my wife about this she's a graphic designer you know artist and a large part of her job is like, okay, they have a new project. They're working on a, a logo or something. Like she's actually working on a logo right now, about ten feet from me, like for her job. And like, she spends a lot of time just researching and looking at other logos and kind of, okay, what's the theme? What are we doing? Like, what is this supposed to represent? And then just starts researching and looking and finding ideas, and then kind of piecemealing those ideas together until she has. Um, you know, kind of something that's more original, more unique to what she wants to apply it to. So, and I, and I think it's the exact same case. I mean, you, uh, why would you not want to take something that, that you know, a great kind of played and you admire and you like and learn how to play it and then be like, okay, I can change this a little bit. Like you were saying earlier, ending instead of something ending on one, I want to take this and have, have it end on the end of one or end or on two or something or like transpose it or take a couple notes out or whatever. So... I think it's about creativity and and originality and how <laughs> how much creativity and originality is really out there and then kind of making it your own. So yeah, yeah. Second, the the original question was more about kind of rules of improvisation, which uh. I always find interesting. Like like I talked to Gloria about this on the podcast, you know, quite a bit. Like, um, you know, when you're saying somebody, oh, you want to improvise, like it's almost like this wide open door and they you know this huge field they don't really know where to go or what to do but if you set some rules or parameters up then then that gives them more of a direction to 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 that's impro- you know improvise it seems counterintuitive but it, it seems that's you know, how, but that's how, make, that's how you make that's how you make something make sense right if right, you sure. go into a room i mean so in jazz right unless you're doing and even in free jazz they usually do something you know you're right. you're saying even if you don't plan it out, if there's two people doing whatever, one they'll start doing whatever, and the other person says, "Oh, that that person's doing this nice repetitive lick. I'm either gonna lay something mm-hmm. mellow over it to just blend in with a wash, or I'm gonna sit out and let that happen, because you know you don't want it to be too busy. These are unspoken right. parameters in jazz. You know the lead yeah. sheet's the parameter in <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I think uh, the few times." There's a friend of mine in we we're both master students at Madison and we would free improv all the time. But where I say free, it was tonal. He very much he was a very tonal person. I not so much. And mm-hmm. but we would, you know, so the parameter was pick a key. And we would start there and it would always change and whatever, you know, we never ended in the same key. But that was just influence you know and we're percussionists we would always all these improv improvisations would be on marimba and vibe so then if he says we're in e major then i go oh well i know my hands like to make these shapes easier and i can do these licks easier in e major so that even just giving yourself a key set or just a key center really helps influence what you physically think you can or cannot do so right sure yeah, cool. Um, so we talked about some music, uh, improvisation, uh, Chicago, a little comedy. Um, <laughs> before we kind of wrap up um, our conversation, I, you're also, I mean, you, you referenced earlier, 
in our conversation about composition. Like, um, is this largely um, kind of jazz standard kind of composition or are you doing kind of orchestral stuff or a mix or what do you have going on? Um, right now I'm just, I'm trying really hard to write <laughs> percussiony things. Cause I, right. uh, I, all of my writing as of the last several years has been jazz. I'm not a okay. terribly amazing orchestral minded composer, but a lot of the jazz that I write, it's you can very much tell what I'm listening to. The last several things I've noted down, very Tigran Hamasian inspired. <laughs> then there are some tunes from I was just playing some tunes that I found in a stack of stuff I wrote, and they're very much you know they sound like jazz standards out of the, out of the real book. They're very Cole right. Cole Portery. Or what have you. So right. um, that was my just trying to be very traditional. But also, like you were saying, I go through waves of trying to be really original. And then I realize that's a lost cause. And then I'll just, you know, right. I'll just take someone else's um, chord changes and then write a new melody, you know, do some contrafacts. That's a nice exercise right. to just get some creative juices going. But Sure. Just writing for me currently. There are a couple. I think yeah. I mentioned to you in an email. There's, there's been an emergence of places trying to give composers of color greater voices. So this is right. the time to take advantage of that. <laughs> right. So what? Well, that's yeah. You did mention emerging black composer project. That's through uh, California, San Francisco. Yeah. Is that what you mentioned? Yeah. So what's the that. What's the what are some details of that project and how are you participating? Um, so I'm also I'm not gonna lie, as I'm as talented <laughs> At least you're at least you're honest. Uh, I'm as talent I'm as lazy <laughs> as, as I am talented. <laughs> and um this right. application, I mean, you know, it's kinda like with when you look at grad school or any audition that's you you say that's not hard i've played all those excerpts and that's not a lot of excerpts the only thing is you have to play those excerpts better than how many people so but this application uh for this emerging black composers project it's you just have to submit three scores i believe yeah three representative works and you can they let you choose between jazz combo or big band wind ensemble solo vocal you know the whole gamut they oh, sure. they have opera full orchestra chamber orchestra but that caught my eye because a lot of what i write i have not yet written like big band things i've written larger mm-hmm. ensemble but i think the largest ensemble i ever wrote for is seven but so i innately write a lot of chamber or jazz combo stuff so that was appealing because they're also trying to represent all of the facets so i don't think you know only two people are going to win and they will both be orchestra composers i think they're trying to be there's at least one from everything represented so Mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it already sounds like you're you're like compositions are fairly diverse and at least your field kind of of interest is diverse. So you, maybe you have a fair amount to kind of draw on maybe. So is this like some existing stuff that you'll rework or you're like down back to the drawing board? I, whenever I have things, I try not to do too many repeating things, but I've sure. been compositionally lazy for quite some time. So I have a lot of little sketches. Right. So I'm going to revisit some sketches and there are, I do have some older tunes that have, you know, they're done, they're finished, they just need to be, or, you know, it's like I wrote them for friends, so I could just tell them this, and I didn't need to write it in the music, but now I have to go through and actually make it presentable for other people. Right. But, yeah, there are a couple old tunes I think are worth submitting. We'll see. Yeah, cool. Well, um, I mean, before we kind of sign off, where... Um, where can people find you? Like, where can they find some of these works or find out more information about you? You got a YouTube channel. You got a 
You got a MySpace account. What do you got? LinkedIn. Yeah, I've got I've got some uh, <laughs> wax cylinder recordings, and <laughs> let's see. Right. You can. My personal website is Andrew Baldwin Percussion. Super long, but uh, right. that. And then I have. I think there's links to my YouTube on it. I'm also just going to be. A lot of my social things as of late have kind of geared more towards the comedy. So if you really want yeah, if you yeah. if you really want to find me for my music, I would go through my website and then uh right. yeah. Well, I'm man, I'm open to plug in whatever you got. So whatever uh you know, if you want people to check out, you know, the the comedy stuff you have going on, like I, we can throw links into our show notes or you can shout out whatever you want. For sure. Whatever you want to drive people oh, to. Man. Well, yeah. if you like if you like podcasts, which you clearly do, <laughs> um, a, <laughs> right. a friend of mine yeah. from one of my uh, comedy groups, uh, that group is called Diversity Higher. We have a podcast okay. where we just review horror movies. Um, so if you dig both of those things, I think it's called right. it's called We Die First, and that's on Apple Podcasts. And then all of the social things for that are just We Die First Pod, P-O-D, Instagram, Twitter, and right now those are my creative projects but feel free to keep checking yeah, cool. out that website for anything that i do <laughs> we'll <laughs> we'll drive those hits up for you yeah <laughs> yeah cool we'll we'll get uh yeah we'll get everything in the show notes and other than that man i i appreciate your time and it's cool um like i tell most of the people i talk to i love like kind of learning something new about people so <laughs> i mean right out of the gate we were talking about like stuff that that i think was really interesting about you but then just about you know the percussion industry or you know people want to build a music career in general and then obviously kind of your diverse area of interest so thanks a lot appreciate it and you know i appreciate all your support too so yeah thanks for having me thanks for having me in the bsp fam i brag about it yeah. too much <laughs> <laughs> okay well <laughs> you brag as much as you want me I'll, t- <laughs> well, I'll take it i'll take it but Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. This has been a BSP production, recorded and produced out of the Black Swamp Percussion Facilities in Zeeland, Michigan. Audio and production assistance by Jamel Taylor and Nathan Coles. Intro and outro music by Adam Hopper. And music sprinkled throughout the episode was performed by Andrew Baldwin and friends. 